Keith, maybe uh, I'll get you to read now from the um, from the story, which is um, in the issue, and you can set it up there. But it's set in New York anyway, and that will get us back to New York. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, as I said. I was in I was in New York for a few. I think it was five months in the end. And when I was really in the late. 80s, or the second half of the 80s anyway. And I was about 20 years old and I was pretty stupid, pretty stupid 20 year old. And I, I was kind of naive and, um, um, anyway. I don't think I need to tell you anything else that I just go into. For a while I live in Washington Heights, reading Russian novels at a kitchen table in someone's apartment, some friend of a friend. I sweat and drink tea. I listen to phone-in radio shows and talk all night with people who come and go. I don't know anything about anything, but people seem to like me. We have enough money to go for beers, but we look too young for a lot of places and feel too young for a lot of others. I make a half-hearted effort at finding gay bars. I don't. New York, I decide, doesn't have any gay bars. It's okay, I'm not even really thinking about it. When I get my job, I move to somewhere up in the Bronx. I move in with another guy I know from Dublin and his girlfriend and someone else and I don't like any of them. I read more Russian novels. People don't come and go anymore. Everything settles down into something that begins to feel boring. I take the subway to work. I work as a doorman in an apartment building on Park Avenue up in the 70s. Wealth. I buy a book of Frank O'Hara poems. I've never read Frank O'Hara before. He reminds me of sex. I haven't had sex yet in New York. I start looking at men on the trains. I follow a guy once because he looks back at me. Nothing comes of anything. Work isn't hard, but the hours are long. I'm bored. New York, I decide, is boring. <laughs> the building where I work is tall and wide and deep and filled with millionaires with maids and servants, just like in the Russian novels. I find it difficult to tell the residents and their staff apart. Some maids wear pinafore things, but many don't. Some nannies are very well dressed. They just look like rich young mothers. Part of my job is to take deliveries up to the apartments via the service elevators. The elevators are operated with a handle, a lever, and they can be stopped anywhere, so there's a skill that I never master in getting the floor of the elevator level with the floor where I'm stopping. I keep tripping into the kitchens of the wealthy. Maids or residents let me in and take the bags or whatever it is and get me to take the stuff to the kitchen table or the kitchen counters, or to put them on the floor somewhere. Sometimes I get a tip. Sometimes kids let me in and they are always rude. Their parents can be rude as well. Maids are never really rude, just impatient or abrupt or hustled. One day a woman in a dressing gown gets me to put her half a dozen bags of groceries on the table while she watches me. Put that one on the floor, she says at one point, standing behind me. Then put another one on the floor, carefully. When I'm done, I look at her and she looks at me and lets her dressing gown fall open and asks me if I'd like a tip. I say, no, you're okay, thanks. And trip back into the elevator. When I get downstairs, one of the other doormen looks at me and laughs. Another time I get stuck in one of the elevators with a guy who was doing work on one of the top floors. The elevator is always getting stuck. You have to fiddle with it. And if that doesn't work, you have to use the intercom to try and rouse someone downstairs. And the building super does whatever it is that gets it moving again. It's never f stuck for very long. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't seem to bother the guy either. We chat while, he w while we wait, and he tells me that a kid like me must be drowning in pussy in New York City. He tells me that with a peachy little Irish ass like mine, I must be fighting off the faggots in New York City. I just smile at him. He starts rubbing his crotch and goes quiet for a while, and I fiddle with the elevator lever. And then he says, I really want to come. Do you want to come too? And I say, no, you're okay, thanks. <laughs> and he says, well, let's see. And he takes his cock out and starts stroking it and looking at me. Come on, kid, he says, I can see your heart. What's the harm? He drops his trousers and his shorts and gets into it. I don't know where to look. I think I should probably tell him to stop, but I don't. I'm worried about where he's pointing it, but when he comes, he turns slightly and it goes all over the floor. I enjoyed that, he says, gasping. I'm glad you enjoyed it, too. When we get down, he steps out and takes the super aside to ask him, about something. I get a cloth. When I stand up, the super is there with his head stuck into the elevator, sniffing. He doesn't say anything. At the end of the day, the guy gives me a $100 tip and his card with his home number written on the back. 
I decided that people in New York like sex after all, <laughs> that some of them might like sex with me, and I decide to work out ways of making that happen. Thanks, Keith. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I won't say that. <laughs> does that bring us back to? Yeah, where does that leave us? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to go choose to look at that as kind of um, <laughs> an exploration of New York energy. Um, and <laughs> um, <laughs> Say your name again, you were. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yes, yeah, so maybe just say a bit more about the story then. Well, actually, there's one thing that when Joe was talking about yeah. about the way the fact that we find ourselves where we find ourselves due to circumstances that have most of the time have absolutely nothing to do with the fact that we're writers mm -hmm. and we make the best of it. And I think that's always the case in 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 my experience and where I've been. Um, and I think that when you think you're being influenced by the energy of a place or by the non-energy of a place, I currently live in Edinburgh, which is the quietest city in the world. Um, it's, these things are, are kind of only half the story, or perhaps even not even half the story, perhaps only a third of the story, perhaps they're even less than that. It, it, it's something else that's going on, and it's your own life that's going on. And actually, you know, in the context of this discussion, the writer and the city, I think I'm a little cynical about the extent to which where we are is influencing what we're doing. Um, and when I, I, well, no, that's that's it. Yeah. And um, but Nick, you, would, I mean, is it different than for poetry? I think, I think, yeah, I think he's right when it comes to fiction, because in fiction you do tend to be writing about a little world that you've constructed and stuff, but with poetry, I do find that the general conversation kind of comes into your work. I mean, you, you have your first language, of course, which in my case is, you know, Jerome speak, as it were, but other stuff come in. I'll, I'll, I'll read these two short poems over yeah. here, actually, to show you what I mean about the, the energy. And the first one is, is called Go Giants, which is obviously kind of resonant in New York, a phrase, you know, which you hear a lot, but for me, anyway, when you leave home, home follows, and it ends up always sort of all these poems that I think are about New York always tend to be about Northern Ireland. So this Go Giants sort of it almost comes back to talking about Ian Paisley and Jerry Adams in some way, I, I think. But anyway, I'll read the poem. Go Giants. The first reference, by the way, Google Gadget Legs is from Inspector Gadget, the very popular 1980s country. Go Giants. Go, go, gadget legs, go right, go left, go wrong, go west, go down to the sea in ships, go down to the river and pray, go fish, go first, go forth and multiply, go in now and say goodbye, go blind, go deaf, go short, go long, go to press, go to pot, go fuck yourself, go straight, go braves, go jump in a lake, go hard, go high, go down with a case of, go ape, go without, go patriots, go halves. Go slow, go under the knife, go under the sign of the war shaft, go one better, go great guns, go south, go out in the midday sun, go red, go blonde, go vandals, go tell it on the mountain, go and sin no more, go compare, go nuclear, go back to E7 from E8, go paperless, go cowboys, go redskins, go naked, go to ground, go ahead, go abroad, go to grass, go slack, go all ironic, Go down in a blaze of, go titans, go for the sake of, go saints, go fly a kite, go against, go gaga, go in peace to love and serve the, go and get help, go directly to jail, go down in flames, go up and smoke, go for broke, go tell Aunt Rody, go tell the Spartans, go to hell, go into detail, go for the throat. Anyway, I don't know what's going to do in New York, but it seems to be kind of, all the things you have to overhear in the city, and that sort of, uh, that crosstalk and eavesdrop seem to uh, is entering my poetry now, but I think he's right in terms of the fiction, it's something um, separate. Um, this is a similar kind of thing, it's called Epithalamium, which just means a, a poem for a wedding. Um, and it uh, partly came about by sitting, watching um, television in a flat I used to rent in Chelsea. Um, you're beeswax and I'm bird shit. I'm mostly harmless. You're irrational. If I'm iniquity, then you're theft. One of us is supercalifragilistic. 
If I'm the most insane, disgusting filth, you're hardly curiosa. You bubble wrap to my fingertips. You winter sleep and I'm the bee dance. And I am menthol and you are eggshell. When you're atrocious, I am spell check. You're the yen. I'm the Nepalese pound. If I'm homesteading, you're radical chic. I'm carpet shock and you're the real. A memory foam day on price drop TV and you're the lord of misrule who shrieks when I surface and goggles through duckweed and I am Trafalgar and you're Waterloo and frequently it seems to me that I am you and you are me. If I'm the rising incantation, you're the charm or I am or you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. All right. Um, so you were maybe... Um, like, if it's, would you say that you're kind of influenced by place, or like, where do novels just happen in in places? Um, because the, you know, like, where does place come in in the construction of a novel for you? Well, I, I think I think uh, does place impact on the characters, or do the characters just? don't think about these things yeah, under your ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, for me, uh, but then uh, what, what is well, it? for me, uh, Dublin, I remember going back to Dublin and I had grown up there and I thought I knew what it was and we all thought we knew what it was. And then suddenly it, we came from an 800 year recession to about 10 boom years and then straight back into another 800 year recession. <laughs> and then everybody was saying, you know, this idea of place, there was all this notion about uh, I suppose because the Irish writers do get a lot of money from the government and you do get grants and bursaries that you don't get over here. But there was a lot of general anger with writers and people were saying, why aren't the, I I why aren't the Irish writers, uh, why didn't they address the Celtic Tiger? Why haven't they written about it? And I was thinking, well, the boom is very short and it takes a really long time to write a book. So you could have written and finished, you, you could be halfway through your book about the Celtic Tiger and it was over. <laughs> So it was probably a good idea not, you know, and then there was a demand that you should be writing almost sociologically. It was a very strange thing. I mean, people were really up in arms going, the Irish writers have neglected us. We're paying them all this money, which they were. They were giving, you know, people wear on canoeuses and there's uh, uh, bursaries and they felt that we should be like addressing their current problems. Yeah, but I don't we know. Weren't. I don't know if that there's anything like that in New York where there's a kind of discussion as to whether writers here should, I mean, maybe someone in the audience can fill us in, you know, are, is there that um, push for writers to write about certain topics, which there does seem to be in Ireland, you know, writers are expected to address certain big themes it's of like the day. It's like our civil servants or something mm -hmm. that we should be in service of, yeah. you know, when we had money, like when we had our own money, they put all the writers on the money, which was kind of ironic since none of them got any money when they were alive. But suddenly, yeah. they were what we put on the money. I found that very strange, that seeing writers well, on the money. We, <laughs> we're very good at celebrating uh, writers once they're dead. Uh, you know, they, they become safer and yeah. you know, much more easy to, do, to handle and to put in, in the place we want them to be. And I guess, I guess, I suppose coming back to Ireland, because I ended up back in Ireland, but again, not really through choice, but sort of ended up through uh, just life collapsing around me. I ended up back home, and uh, I was looking around, and it was a completely different home. Like, everybody in the bars were, uh, everybody serving you. Uh, you know, I had Americans on the plane going, well, we used to come to Ireland to meet the Irish, and now nobody in the hotels or bars are Irish, so it's not the same experience going back. We're back again, by the way. So, <laughs> but it's it's uh, uh, but it was that moment in Dublin that uh, interested me, and that's where. Baby zero, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm and I because because suddenly Dublin was a city of immigrants. There was yeah. a huge influx, and it was very different to you know we were always the ones going out, going out, and then suddenly people were coming in. It was uh, uh, it was a shock, and it was very sudden. It was suddenly suddenly Dublin had uh, black areas. Like I teach, I do outreach for Trinity, and there's schools I teach in in Blanchardstown now that seventy percent of the children are African born in Ireland, but with African parents, and names like Sean and Kena and uh, uh, 
but the parents and even no, no, I haven't met any African members yet. <laughs> but it was, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's it's suddenly this kind of new place that opened up, and I had this baby zero was. Uh, 